Hello, today we're talking about dry cows. So welcome to the NDS North America YouTube channel. We're going to be talking about dry cows, basic general considerations, and we have Heather Dan, Dr. Heather Dan from the Minor Institute. Her background includes a bachelor's at Cornell, a master's from Penn State, and a PhD uh, under Jim Drakeley at the University of Illinois. And she is currently a lead researcher at the Minor Institute, focusing a lot on dairy dry cows and general dairy nutrition, as well as facilities and management implications on cow health and productivity. And I am happy to have my friend Heather Dan with us today, and I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Dan. All right, thanks, Curry. I'm glad to uh, join you today and spend a few minutes just talking about some thoughts on nutritional management strategies for dry cows. For me, I think that nutrition and management during the dry and the fresh periods really do dictate the success or failure for that lactation. And, and for me, when I think about it, transition success occurs when the cow calves and then it's healthy and early lactation produces a large quantity of milk with good components and when the time is right is able to reproduce and if we have enough cows that have transition success then typically that dairy then is going to be profitable and sustainable unfortunately though sometimes we face some challenges in meeting our transition success goals and although we've done a good job of improving our nutrition and management programs on farms to reduce the amount of clinical health problems we have in that transition period, we are still challenged with many subclinical as well as at times clinical issues. The ones that I'm focused on today relate to energy balance and the occurrence of subclinical ketosis in our fresh cows as well as subclinical hypocalcemia that occurs. And Oftentimes, I think we think about subacute ruminal acidosis as being a uh, peak cow problem, but I think if we get the transition wrong from our carbohydrate transition from the dry period into that fresh and early lactation period, then our fresh cows can be at risk for subacute ruminal acidosis. The good news is that we can mitigate several of these health problems with properly formulated diets. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the best formulated diets cannot overcome suboptimal management practices. So we really need to focus on implementing management practices that allow access to good quality feed while minimizing social and environmental stressors, and at the same time, promoting cow comfort. Now here I've showed several different schemes that can be used on our dairy herds uh, on how we can group and feed animals. And oftentimes the particular scheme that is used is gonna be dictated by the management strategy of the farm or the manager as well as the facilities that that farm supplies. I think oftentimes the the top scheme, the one that has a far off and close up dry groups followed by a fresh and early lactation is oftentimes easier to implement because it allows us to provide a targeted diet to each group of animals that most closely meets their unique physiological needs. However, all of these diets I've seen or schemes I've seen to be successful in being implemented in the field. I think the one common thing though is that we need to keep in mind is that whatever scheme that we're using, that we need to make sure that we're formulating the diets in the context of each other. Now as we formulate diets, I think one of the most important questions is to know is how much TMR are the cows actually eating? And it seems like a simple question, but oftentimes I'm discouraged when the dairy doesn't know it or they have not measured it. And that makes formulating diets that much more difficult and becomes an important part in meeting the needs of the animal. The other thing is that intake is critical for transition success. This intake is gonna be controlled by physical and chemostatic mechanisms. It's gonna be influenced by the feeding management practices on that farm, as well as the social interactions of cows within the pen and actually people with the cows, as well as the general environment. And what we wanna see during this transition period is that cows maintain their dry matter intake during the far off and close up period. And then once they calve, that they're gonna increase that intake very rapidly. Now, one of the reasons we wanna keep cows maintaining their dry matter intake during that dry period and actually not increase as we move into the close-up period is that cows have a very 
good ability to overconsume energy during this dry period, whether it's during the far off period or even during the close up period. And cows on what we would consider maybe a moderate energy type diet, they have the ability to consume about 150 to 180 percent of their energy needs very easily. And so when we see cows in that type of situation where they're being overfed as either a far off or close up dry cow, what they have is actually increased abdominal fat deposition, which around the time of calving is going to increase their insulin resistance and make them more prone to metabolic problems. We'll see elevated blood non-esterified fatty acids and beta-hydroxybutyrate, as well as accumulation of liver triglyceride that impairs the ability of the liver to function properly. Along with that, we'll see increased body weight and body condition loss after calving, even though they had gained or maintained uh, body weight or body condition during the dry period. There's several physiological changes that actually contribute to chronic inflammation if uh, this situation goes on for long enough and ultimately can result in an increase in a number of health problems. Uh, and really accompanying these increases in the things I just identified that it's really driven by a larger decrease in dry matter intake or not being able to consume enough energy in that early lactation period. And therefore they have those cows will have lower milk production. They'll go on to have poor reproductive performance and ultimately not be as profitable as a, a producer would hope for. So the good news is though that we have some tools in our box that we can uh, use to be able to control energy intake in the cows. And, and one approach that we can use is by feeding higher forage, lower energy diets during either a one group dry period or during a far off or maybe even during a close up period. These high forage controlled or lower energy diets are often going to be based on corn silage and straw if you're in the northeast or midwest of the United States. Sometimes straw will be replaced by hay crop silage or some dry hay. The key thing about these diets is though they're being formulated to provide about 100 to 110 percent of the metabolizable energy requirement of the animal. And in many situations to accomplish this, the diet might contain between 10 and 18 percent starch. It's going to contain a, a large quantity of neutral detergent fiber. The goal here is to allow the cow to eat ad libitum, but at the same time limiting the intake through gut fill, and that's the reason for these higher levels of NDF. Given the lower fermentable carbohydrates that are oftentimes used in these type of diets, the microbial protein synthesis in the rumen isn't as great, and so at times there may be a need to supplement uh, protein to provide enough metabolizable protein. In this case, oftentimes we see levels targeted at 1,000 to 1,300 grams of metabolizable protein for an average size Holstein cow. I think a better way, though, to look at it is on a concentration basis, thinking about 85 to 100 grams of MP per kilogram of dry matter in that it allows us to account for differences in body size of the animal as well as the intake of those animals. And then depending on how this diet is being positioned as a, a one group uh, diet or if it's just being used in the far off period, uh, there would be a DCAT adjustment to be more negative as we move this diet for a one group or a cl close up diet. I think the thing we need to keep in mind is that these values here are just guidelines and really the stat needs to be fine-tuned based on the fermentable carbohydrates that are used and using forage analysis and the digestibility uh, assessments of either NDF or starch are important to be able to fine-tune the stat and ultimately the cow is always going to be right. So we're going to monitor the cows during the dry period uh, look at intake, but we also want to monitor these cows after they calve and understand what impact is this diet having on the performance and health of the cows after calving. Many folks still use a two-group dry system, and I think this works very well. Uh, during this type of system, basically we want to make sure that the far-off cows are continuing to be fed a controlled or low energy diet, meeting about 100 to 110 percent of their metabolizable energy requirement. These type of diets are often quite low in starch, uh, less than 14 percent many times. In the close-up diet, oftentimes we'll see people increase energy slightly uh, to about 100 to 130 percent of requirement. Now, this is often done because if 
a close-up group as a mixed parity grouping strategy that the little bit of energy benefits those heifers that are coming in and being mixed with those mature animals. The starch content oftentimes is increased to allow a smoother transition into a fresh diet that's going to have more fermentable carbohydrates and therefore hopefully reducing that risk of subacute ruminal acidosis. Again, given that these diets tend to be lower in fermentable carbohydrates, both starch and, and fiber, that the microbial protein synthesis isn't always as great as if we were feeding more of a traditional 1990s steam up type diet. And so there'll be use of some supplemental rumen undergradable protein sources. Really the goal is to increase or have a higher amount of metabolizable protein supply, as well as making sure these diets are balanced for minerals and vitamins. Now we can have a properly formulated diet, but sometimes the cows still consume too much energy. And one of the ways that this happens is that the hay and the straw isn't incorporated well and the cows are able to sort the diet. And in the picture shown here, we can see visually that there's circles from the cows sorting, most likely sorting for the grain and against the long particles. And so it's critical that we process the hay or straw that's being used in these diets uh, to minimize sorting. Now we found some success at Miner by using a, a hammer mill to process our straw or our dry hay. And in doing so, we can use the Penn State particle size separator to assess the distribution of the particle sizes. And what we found is that we have very little sorting of straw or hay when incorporated into a, a dry cow diet when we have a distribution such as shown here in this slide where we have about 20% of the particles on the largest screen uh, followed by about 40% on the second screen, 20% on the third screen, and then about 20% in the bottom screen. For those that may still be using the three box system, uh, basically just a general thumb rule of about a third, a third, and a third on each um, box uh, still is kind of a good rule of thumb. The other way that we can minimize sorting is through controlling the moisture content of the TMR and trying to make it a little more difficult to sort grain. This isn't my preferred approach, but it can be effective in some situations. We want to target 42 to 48 percent of the dry matter and use water if necessary to get that dry matter in, in proper range to try to minimize uh, sorting of those diets. An opportunity I see for our dry cows is in how we formulate and look at the protein content of the diets and actually the metabolizable protein supply. With improvements in our models, such as NDS, that's based on the CNCPS platform, I think we have a, a much better handle on how to formulate for protein. No longer do we focus solely on crude protein. Uh, again, we're, we're targeting oftentimes 85 to 100 grams of NP per kilogram of dry matter intake. Now, one of the things that we need to be thinking about, though, is we've done a good job over the last decade or two of reducing body condition score on many of our herds. But now we have cows drying off that maybe we consider thin. And what we've seen in the, the research field is that thin cows before calving mobilize more protein after calving. And so maybe we have to rethink or at least be aware of how the metabolizable protein requirements of those animals uh, may be changing depending on what their, their body condition score uh, is at dry off or through that dry period. In addition, we have to think about the type of stress environment that these animals are under. Stress is the energy and protein hog in the sense that it affects the immune system and there's going to be a greater demand for energy and protein that's diverted away from productive functions but towards the immune system to deal with that high stress environment. There may be an opportunity to modify our metabolizable protein supply based on those type of conditions. The other important point relative to protein is that we want to prevent protein mobilization before calving. Just like cows after calving have a negative energy balance, they do have a negative protein balance. And what we've learned is that mobilization of protein reserves before calving reduces the amount that's available after calving. And if that happens, then it increases the risk of the cow of having ketosis after calving. Just like with our lactating cows, we've learned that amino acid balancing is beneficial for transition cows. Lysine and methionine are assumed to be first limiting. Glutamine looks to be maybe conditionally essential uh, during the fresh period. And there's been some work suggesting that branch chain amino acids are uh, ones that we should 
pay attention to in the future as far as its role in energy metabolism and uh, lactation performance. Currently, supplementing lysine and methionine are both starting before calving and continuing in lactation makes sense because there are several studies that have shown that there's an increase in milk yield, milk components, or both, as well as there's an improvement in immune function. However, I'd caution you that the responses are really dependent on the crude protein supply. If we're overfeeding crude protein, you may not expect uh, quite the benefit to try and do um, overfeed amino acids. We need to pay attention to MP supply as well as looking at the intestinal digestibility of those rumen undegradable protein sources that are used. Field observations and some research studies suggest that targeting lysine around 75 grams per day and 25 grams of methionine per day uh, can help optimize a milk protein response after the cow calves. There are several strategies that can be used to minimize the risk of hypocalcemia. My favorite one is to maintain intake in our dry cows before calving and then encourage dry matter intake after calving. This is going to be positive, not only for reducing the risk of hypocalcemia, but benefit several other health aspects of the animal. Some people will use a prophylactic treatment with oral or sub-Q uh, calcium following calving. Now, those this can be effective and maybe warranted in targeted animals. Uh, I don't necessarily encourage this blanket type of approach for all animals. I'd much rather see a proactive dietary approach used and with the benefit of potentially reducing some labor and interference with that fresh cow calving. Now, the feeding strategies that are most commonly used during the close-up period or in a one-group dry would be feeding low-calcium diets. However, I found that these are often hard to implement, especially in the Northeast, given some variation that we have in our forage quality here. More recently, we've seen a greater adoption of using a calcium binder, such as sodium aluminum silicate, that's able to uh, decrease the absorption of calcium and essentially make it seem as though those cows are experiencing a low calcium diet. And by doing so, this induces a parathyroid hormone response that's going to be favorable uh, to calcium levels after calving. Some people still try to implement low uh, feeding, low potassium uh, forages. And I think this is definitely a way we need to continue. However, doing this solely isn't often enough to prevent subclinical issues on our cow. And so we still see several people adjusting the dietary cation anion difference to try to minimize the risk of milk fever. Essentially, with adjusting the dietary cation anion difference, we're trying to create a negative response in that um, the DCAD values will be negative from zero down to, at times, minus 15 milliequivalents per 100 grams of dry matter. And, and really, each farm is going to titrate this level, given the demographics of their herd and what we see is that herds that have older cows they tend to respond better to a more negative decad strategy the challenge here is balancing the effect of using nx salts or products to achieve the desired decad level with the amount of intake that we want to maintain in these cows but essentially the negative decad is going to cause metabolic acidosis in the cow and reduce the risk of hypocalcemia uh, through changes uh, systemically in the animal that causes more hydrogen to be in the blood. This ultimately decreases the pH in the blood and the urine, and that's why urine is a good indicator to see how well we're doing at achieving our DCAD goals. Through these changes in uh, blood and urine, pH improves the sensitivity of the parathyroid home receptor to um, parathyroid hormone stimulation. And ultimately, what's going to happen is calcium is released from the bone to offset this drop in pH and is going to be excreted from the kidney until hypocalcemia occurs, and then that calcium can be utilized. So in general, what we see is that transition success is more likely to occur when we use transition groups and use a scheme that fits our facilities as well as our management philosophy. The advantage is that we can use targeted diets to better meet the unique physiological needs of each of these groups of animals around the time of calving. The one thing I've learned is that there's no perfect or magic diet approach to transition diets, but there are definitely some common themes that we want to keep in mind, especially as we formulate diets for dry cows. We want to make sure that we maintain dry matter intake before calving. We want to make sure we're optimizing nutrient intake again before calving. 
from an energy perspective, we want to make sure we meet the needs of the animal, but we don't overfeed because there's going to be lots of negative consequences that result from overfeeding energy to these cows. We want to make sure we're providing enough metabolizable protein, in particular essential amino acids, that are going to help this animal um, prepare for the next lactation, as well as making sure the minerals and vitamins are properly balanced in these diets. Although it wasn't the focus today to talk about stressors, I think anytime we're trying to achieve transition success, we need to make sure that we are doing our best to try to minimize any nutritional stressors, such as feed bunk management that may limit feed to cows, as well as think about the environment those animals are housed in and how that may be either positively or negatively influencing their, their transition. And then we can't forget about the interactions that cows have with each other as well as us and how that can impact them. When we're trying to think about achieving transition success, our goal is to minimize the number of stressors that these animals are facing. And I like to think about it as a tower of children's blocks that oftentimes our goal has been to build up the blocks as high as possible. But for when it comes to transition success, we actually wanna keep those towers as low as possible. Otherwise, things will tumble over eventually and we'll have transition failures. Now of late, We've been faced with COVID-19 and the impact that it's having um, downstream uh, through our supply chain and our dairy industry. And because of that, a number of farmers across the country have been asked to reduce milk yields anywhere from five to 20%. In a recent Hordes Dairyman Dairy Livestream broadcast from the end of April, they asked the participants that were attending if your dairy farm is being asked to reduce milk output, which management changes are you considering or enacting? Participants were able to answer one or multiple uh, responses. And what I found really interesting and probably not really surprising is that many people, up 70% of the participants were planning to dry cows off early. Now this brings us, uh, I think a challenge as we think about achieving transition success. Typically, when we think long dry periods, I usually think of uh, a potential train wreck because uh, it's going to jeopardize success in the sense that cows that traditionally dry off early are probably overconditioned, had some type of repro problem, or low producers. And, and so it, basically, these long dry periods put them at greater risk for more metabolic disease and early lactation, less milk, and poor reproduction. I think though we may be able to manage around these longer dry periods for cows that were purposely drying off uh, because these cows aren't hopefully overconditioned and they're not hopefully of low production if we're going to have to dry them off uh, a month or so earlier than what we might. And so I just want to spend the next couple of moments highlighting some of the things that I think are going to be crucial to help us avoid these train wrecks when these cows that we may be drying off. Um, 30 days earlier, so um, come back into lactation. And the first point is that we want to maintain body weight and body condition during a long dry period. We need to avoid an overly long dry period. For me, I'd like to see that dry period less than 70 to 90 days if it's possible. I think it, this is where it's going to be important to understand how much milk do you need to reduce on your farm or the farm that you're working with and really understand, okay, can I dry cows off two weeks early and achieve my goal, or do I need three weeks or four weeks? Um, I really hope that people aren't having to dry cows much more than four weeks off early, because I think that'll really um, give us some challenges. We wanna make sure we're driving cows off in a, a range of 2.75 to 3.25 body condition score on a scale of one to five. Really, to do this effectively, we want to make sure we prepare the cow for the next lactation before the lactation ends, meaning we need to make sure she has appropriate body condition before we're drying her off. We also can maintain this body condition by feeding a low or controlled energy diet that meets the needs of the other nutrients of the, the animal. And this is going to be critical to avoid excess body weight gain. Here I'm showing some data looking at adipose tissue uh, gain in non-lactating, non-pregnant cows after two months on a diet that would represent kind of a moderate energy diet, 
spread during the close-up period or dry period, as well as a low energy, high fiber diet. And what we see here on it, not very surprisingly, is that the cows, when they're fed the moderate energy diet, they consume more, they're not limited by gut fill as in the case of the low energy, high fiber diet. At the time of the study, the animals started with similar body weights, but after two months, their body weights diverged. Uh, with those being overfed, having greater body weight. What I find really interesting about the study is that although they were overfed for two months, that we they weren't able to detect a, a significant difference in body condition score. These animals averaged around 3.5 body condition score units. And so meaning that we can't necessarily use body condition always to judge whether animals are gaining adipose or not. And this is clearly illustrated here where the animals that were overfed, when we look at their internal or abdominal body fat, they gained about 56 pounds more fat when they were overfed compared to animals that were fed more of a lower energy, high fiber diet. And this is going to be important because the ones with more abdominal fat increased risk of ketosis, metabolic problems, insulin resistance as they go through that transition period. As I mentioned, body condition score doesn't tell the whole story. And we need to, if we look at the data here, we have animals divided up into different categories. And, and what's interesting in the blue bars is these are the animals that had the moderate energy intake during those two months compared to the low energy intake in the red. And we're just looking at omental fat to illustrate the point, but that basically our heavy animals, they already have that internal body um, fat accumulation. Uh, but our an thinner animals, they actually have more um, abdominal fat accumulation, even though we don't see concerns maybe with their body condition score. And so what this means to me is that animals may look like they're an appropriate body condition score, but can behave metabolically as if they're fat or over conditioned animals because of that accumulation of adipose tissue internally. So one of the practical things that we can do on farm to kind of monitor this, although body condition score oftentimes is a very useful tool, in this case, by the time we detect a change, we may have already had some negative consequences or gain happening. And so this is where I think body weight change can be very useful to track on a farm. In this case, I'm just showing some data where cows were dried off and their dates shown on the x-axis and then measured those animals for weight at dry off the move to close up, and then it freshening after the calf has been delivered. And if we just focus on the blue diamonds that look at the far off change, what we can see is that on a farm, if you track body weight change over time, you can see what's normal or what's not normal. In this case, this farm around the dry off period of March, uh, animals were gaining additional body, body weight, and that translates into when they calve, they have more metabolic problems like ketosis and DAs. Diet change was made in the May time period, and you can see that cows during that far off period gained less weight than they did prior and actually had reduced uh, value. So I think this is a way to get ahead of those potential train wrecks uh, before cows calve. And if you are seeing excess body weight gain, then you can make some um, proactive decisions on how you may treat those animals as a freshen. I think the other thing that we can do is use a very um, far off dry group. This is a group that I view as separate from our far off and close up dries. We want to use a separate, uh, very far off group when possible, when facilities allow. I think what this allows us to do is avoid disrupting the far off and close up groups, especially if space is limited. Oftentimes, our dry cows don't have the best facilities or we may already have times where they're going to be overcrowded. And so we need to look at unique ways that we can house these animals to not put pressure on here. The last thing that we wanna do while we're making some changes here is do anything that's gonna compromise our fresh cow performance and, and health. And so we need to be creative. Some people may use pasture uh, as an option for these very far off dry cows. And I think as we go forward, we need to make sure we don't forget about heat abatement. One of the things that we've learned over the last several years is that heat stress can negatively affect milk production in the next lactation. And it's not that we just need to cool cows during the close-up period, but some more recent research has suggested that we need to cool those cows during both the, the 
far off and, and close up periods to maximize or optimize the milk production and the next lactation. And so if you think about our late lactation or these cows that are drying off early, that we need to think about what are we typically doing for their heat abatement? Normally they'd be in a lactating barn, most likely with fans and a sprinkler soaker system. And so I wanna make sure that we don't forget about those cows because there's gonna have some consequence in the, their next lactation. The other thing that we need to consider is drying off high producing cows. A lot of these cows, if they're gonna be dried off two to four weeks earlier than normal, will be producing larger amounts of milk than what we typically deal with at dry off. I would recommend looking at the literature that we still want to dry those cows off immediately. We do not want to go to a system where we're milking once a day or every other day. A diet change is going to help dry these animals off. We want to make sure we're reducing the nutrient or the energy density in the diets um, at dry off. And when possible, if, it's, if one is able to feed higher forage diets before dry off, in that light lactation period, that might be one way to help reduce some milk yield uh, prior to having to dry those animals off. And we need to think about as these animals dry off, they're at a high risk for mastitis infection as well as when they calve back in. We want to do everything we can to minimize the mastitis risk. We want to make sure we're using dry cow therapy unless you have a selective therapy plan already in place, uh, making sure we're using internal teat sealants and make sure that we have provided a clean, dry place for those animals to rest when they lay down before those, hopefully those teat canals um, close completely. So with that, I wish you transition success. And if anyone ever has any questions, feel free to contact me um, at Minor Institute. And my email is dan, D-A-N-N, -N, at whminor.com. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Heather. Wow, a lot of, a lot of golden nuggets in there. I, I especially like the train analogy. Don't just slam on the brakes. They avoid a train wreck, you got to slow the motor down. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, Kurt. Yep. I think one of the critical points that kind of overlay what all of this that Heather has presented is how to characterize the dry cow, actually starting with the late lactation cow, and characterize her properly so that she maintains equilibrium during the far dry period and is appropriately ramped up on energy uh, in the close-up. Because as I look at Heather's uh, paradigms of transition cow groups, there's potentially three to four diet changes within a relatively you know, two-month, 60-day time frame or less. I do like, that is a novel idea to possibly for those looking to dry off cows early giving this dairy situation in 2020 spring of 2020 um, to start a new group rather than overcrowding your standard dry cow system i really like that idea of a very far far group to help smooth that transition and what we have here I think Dave Weber has got a nice graph where we can show diet transitions. But first off, I wanted to look at how we define that far dry cow in animal inputs. And as, as in Heather's presentation, that omental and mesenteric fat is critical. If you're gauging your cow's metabolic status by looking at body condition scores rather than body weights. Um, if you're waiting for a change in body condition score to verify that she's getting too much energy, it's already way too late. She's packed on that excess fat internally before you can see it um, on the external visual of body condition scoring. So it becomes critical to set up these dry cows with the proper days carried calf because there are certain dates that are going to trigger uh, within NDS the calculations on available energy um, allowable daily weight gains. So in this case, we've got a little over two lactation uh, animal, typical calving interval of 13 months. 
and she's currently weighing 1,600 pounds. And if our estimations of full body weight are correct, she's going to finish growing at 1725. So we have her uh, recently dried off. She's 220 days pregnant. And in this scenario, we have a case. Um, she's being dried off at 3-1. We don't necessarily want her to become a 3-4, but she seems to be thin at dry off, and we can tolerate some weight gain but I caution on that. Three, four seems like a bit much. I'm going to, for this case, I'm going to switch this to far off dry cow. We don't want her gaining a whole lot of weight. Let's just keep her at three, one. And uh, we should have done a better job of, of having her gain condition as a tail end milking cow. And we're going to say she's going to be in this group for far dry for 30 days. And this allows for targeted growth. Since she's still trying to physiologically mature, we do have to account for some growth. All right, so let's go back to the diet. And in this farm that we stole, we have some decent corn silage, um, some hay, some straw, maintain gut fill, since we're going to get a lot of energy out of that corn and some soy to maintain our MP balance. In this case, so she is going to gain a little bit of weight as that calf is growing. This is um, pregnancy weight gain here, and this is allowable mature growing of the animal herself. MP is a little over um, for what she's needing, but I'm okay with that for now. Uh, let's see. One of the other values I like to look at is where the fermentable carbohydrates are coming from in, in all of my diets, but especially the far and the close. It's like we may, we've got a fairly low starch diet. Actually, I might go lower on this far group, probably down to 12 or 14, because we're going to step up to 18 as a close-up group. But in this situation, looking at the green values and the percent of fermentable carbohydrate, we can see that 29% of the fermentable carbohydrate is from starch. And that worries me a little bit in this group because starch is a high energy source, um, could trigger an insulin response. Our soluble fiber and sugars are only accounting for 24%, and our fiber fermentable fiber is less than 50. Usually I've been tracking some of these diets and I like to see NDF providing at least 50% of the fermentable carb, starch maybe 25% and the remaining 25% from soluble fiber and sugars. So Kurt, one of the discussions with this farm has been trying to make a heifer quality forage instead of feeding, you know, milk quality silage to the heifer and dry cow. So that'll be a good discussion to have with, yeah. the, with the farm. So it, it, the, what you and I have been discussing recently is, is looking at the old school NEL values that we used to think, oh, keep it, look, keep it below 0.6 and everything will be fine. Um, but with improved estimations of energetic values from starches and fibers from the CNCPS program, uh, we, say, we see that the new predicted NEL is 0.65. And to me, that is a huge disconnect uh, indicating that we've got to revisit this diet um, in relation to how we've described this cow to make sure this is a weight gaining diet and this is probably a weight maintaining diet and that disconnect uh, as Heather mentioned if you're looking at body condition score changes it's going to be way too late that you realize you were feeding this level of energy. Uh, Dave any more thoughts on this one? No I think uh, just for today's check can you just go up there and change the the uh, days carried calf and let's just change that to 21 days pre-calving so 
Let's make her 265. Yep. And then we can just show the mammogenesis. So this would be, I know we didn't change the diet, but we just changed day's carry calf. So we made her a close-up cow and gave her a mammogenesis requirement. So we can just see the effect of increasing the ME requirement and the MP requirement in those fields just by changing the days in the close-up. Of course, we would go and change the diet, you know, the ingredients around. But just to show how to use NDS, and then under other items over there in the lower right, or lower left, sorry, um, now you it does give you any of the DCAT equations you would like to see. And then over to the middle of that section, once you describe that animal as a close-up animal, you get the urine pH hypocalcemia and the plasma calcium values, some NEPAs and potassium to magnesium ratios. And again, this is not a close-up diet. Hopefully, we'd make a few more changes, but just to show the, the functionality in NDS and then how that changes with the 21 days pre-calving, we get the mammogenesis requirement. So let's see here. I think I have a better, no, this is a, this is the better far off diet. I'm sorry. Well, and that was the point for the discussion. I guess um, just with the whole idea, like you stated with, and, and Dr. Heather brought up the fact that, uh, you know, the change in today's uh, market-driven procedures may be giving us some changes in how we dry off cows, when we dry off cows, looking for how long this will last, this uh, milk marketing and, and uh, the milk um, crisis, I guess, that we're in. But, uh, you know, when we get these cows back, are we going to, you know, get them into a shape where we can get milk production back out of them? And so just reviewing that dry cow stuff that you guys have gone over nicely, I think um, a great opportunity to look at how do we do this right so that we don't prevent more issues? What can we do be doing better? And uh, I've just always appreciated all the information that Dr. Dan has focused in on that and then looking at a couple tools in NDS. So I think we can wrap this up. Kurt, do you have any other thing you want to bring up? And No, I, I think that's we've covered what we need to right here. I really appreciate Dr. Heather Dan. Um, just the expertise, the constant looking at, you know, the startup milk actually starts as we dry up and keep those cows on there. So I thank you for your time. And hopefully we can do another few of these. We did a session on transitioning rations across a farm in a previous YouTube. So if that's of interest, take a look at that one. But I think we've covered this nicely today. So thanks everybody for your time. Yes, thank you, Heather. Yep, my pleasure.